Good morning. How we doing? A little warm out there? Our air conditioning is not working, as you could tell. So um, Joel is working on that right now. And we don't know if it will be fixed before the service ends or not. So um, I could either A, preach a shorter message, or B, preach until the air gets turned on. Shorter, shorter. <laughs> Boy, you didn't think long and hard about that, did you? Oh, I have. So I guess Joel and Whitney have been a little busy, a little preoccupied this week, new grandparents. We want to congratulate the Peschels, Aaron and Ryan. And little Landon, he's doing well, and they're doing well, and adjusting to first-time parenting. So pray for them and encourage them, and we're so excited for that family. And I want to encourage you, I came over here with a tie on this morning, and my sleeves rolled down, and I've changed that. So uh, if you feel free, if you want to take your coat off or loosen up your tie, please feel that freedom to do that. We're going to begin the service with a word of prayer, and then we're going to stand together and sing. We ask that you put your mask on for that, but uh, I think even in the warm temperatures, the Lord will use this time together. That's our prayer. Father, we thank you for a Sunday. It's not the Sunday that we would have hoped as we become so accustomed to air conditioning, and I know that it's a little bit uncomfortable, but Father, we know that you brought us here for a reason, and that is to be with other believers. And uh, we want to worship you together. We want to celebrate what you've done in our life. We want to open up the words that you've given to us to, to study them and apply them to our life, and that we might exhort and encourage one another uh, as we go out into the world. We know that there's so many that can't be with us today. We pray for them, pray for their, their health, pray for their strength, pray for their uh, faith, that you would strengthen them in those areas. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand together and sing our songs together. Crown him with many crowns and worship the king. Crown him with many crowns the lamb upon his throne. I count the heavenly and come crowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for me and hail him as thy matchless king throughout eternity.
be seated. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, thank you, Vicki. Well, I've got a couple of announcements. We're going to change up the order of service a, a little bit and give you some announcements that uh, are, are pertinent. Next Sunday, you'll notice on the back of your, your worship order of worship, you'll see names of deacons uh, or potential deacons. We're going to have our deacon election next Sunday. We're going to do that at the very beginning of the service. And our chairman of the deacons, Neil Faircloth, he'll handle all of that. But that will be happening next Sunday. And the eligible men there are on the back of your order of worship. Uh, I mentioned this in our newsletter. If you've never did receive one of our newsletters, uh, we have some copies down here in the front pew, and I think we may have some out in our lobby. But uh, one of the things that it mentioned in that newsletter is at the end of the month on October the 24th, that's a Saturday, we are partnering with New Destiny Christian Church here in Quincy. They are the newest member of the Gadsden County Baptist Association with a food drive. They have... Um, coordinated with the Florida Baptist Convention. This is a lot different than the food distribution we do here. This is something through the Florida Baptist Convention. They have 1,300 boxes of food. All of those boxes are identical. They're 21 pounds a piece. They have meats and cheeses and, and dairy and a lot of great stuff in there, fruits and vegetables, things like that. So we're going to partner with them, and they're asking for a few volunteers. So I, I think about five volunteers from our congregation would be sufficient. A couple of members from my family are going to be going over there. I know one person has already made a contact with our church. So looking for three or four other individuals, if you might be willing to do that. Again, that's Saturday, October the 24th. It's roughly around 8 or 8.30 in the morning until all the food is given away, which probably take a couple of hours, I would imagine. But if you can help out, give Donna a call at the church office and let her know. Which reminds me, we have changed our email address, so I want to make sure I give that to you. Quincy First Baptist at gmail.com. That's Quincy First Baptist at gmail.com. You also should know because of that newsletter is that next Sunday we are going to begin Sunday school again. We're going to start up Sunday school same time, but it might be in a different location depending upon your class. So some classes will be meeting in their same room. We will probably modify their tables uh, settings and where how things were configured. Uh, rest assured, we're not going to take anything out of your Sunday school classroom. So teachers, we're not going to move anything out of the room, but we might need to reconfigure the way the room is set up. A couple of classes are relocating. Uh, the men's class, Neil's class, will be in the chapel. And the Sheehan class will be in the fellowship hall. I know those are two room switches. And not every class is meeting. There are a handful of classes that aren't meeting. So that might pertain to you. You are more than welcome to join any of the other classes. In fact, I talked to our young adults, our high school graduates and above. I've said that you're welcome to come to my class. I'll be leading the youth in the youth room. So uh, I hope that you'll be able to uh, find a place that you can settle into, uh, at least temporarily, but we want to make everyone know that um, next Sunday we'll start back with Sunday school. And uh, at the very beginning, we will require masks throughout the duration of the Sunday school class. Uh, however, our deacons are meeting and will continue to meet and discuss these things and we'll try and make decisions that will be in the best um, interest of the health of each and every individual in our congregation. But we do appreciate your cooperation in wearing masks where we ask you to wear masks and thank you for, for how you've handled that. I appreciate that so much. Well, I've already mentioned to you the happy grandparents. Joel, do you have any good news for us on the air conditioning? Is it a fire speech? No. <laughs> no. Well, the stage is set for that. It's not getting any good. It's, okay, okay, well, hopefully next week, hopefully next week. Well, thank you for your, for your attempt, and, uh, and I'll too, we're, we're going we're gonna to cut Vicky's special this week, and I'm going to probably knock out three or four points from my 15-point message, so we'll be all right, we'll be all right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, and I wanted to tell you what I was praying for. I forgot to tell you that. Tuesday night, we had our Gaston County Baptist Association annual meeting. And uh, as I was down there, and, and I'm saying this because we're, we're family, um, Thomas Memorial still has not found a pastor. 
and uh, that congregation is is I think growing more and more discouraged about that and uh, I told them that that we would pray for them and I want to do that this morning so we're going to pray for Thomas Memorial as they are searching for a pastor so would you join me in that father we lift up the congregation just down the street a congregation that was really birthed out of this congregation. Uh, they're not only they're a, a church in our association, not only are they a church of like faith, but they're our brothers and sisters, and uh, they're discouraged. They're hurting because they can't find the right man to come pastor the church down there. And there's a number of reasons for that, Lord. We know that. We commit that to your hands. But we are also lifting them up to you, asking that you would intervene, that you would give them strength and courage and faith, that they would not lose hope, that the men and women who are responsible on that search committee, that you would help them to continue to be diligent and that you would cross the path of with them and their next pastor very soon we thank you for the ministry of dr jumper thank you for his willingness to travel so far and to invest so much into their life we pray for your blessing and your safety upon him and his wife and uh, we thank you that they're in your hands and we trust you in that lord in jesus name we pray amen i'm going to turn it over to bill as he sings our special music today Market place is empty, no more traffic in the streets, all the builders' tools are silent, no more time to harvest wheat, busy housewives cease their labor in the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended As the king comes through the gate Happy faces line the hallways Those whose lives have been redeemed Broken homes that he has mended Those from prison he has freed children and the aged and in hand stand all aglow to a crippled broken ruin that in garments white as snow but I can hear the chariots rumble and I can see the marching throng and the flurry of God's trumpets spells the end and sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding, heaven's choir is all in place, heaven's choir is now assembled. Start to sing the coming, the King is coming, I just heard the trumpet sounding, and soon his face I'll see, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, he is coming for me. sounding and now his face I see oh, the king is coming yes the king is coming praise God praise God praise God he is coming for me take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 120 
27, chapter 127. We have just finished what arguably is one of the most challenging books in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. So we're going to spend the next... It's, Four weeks. It's a four week sermon. We're going to be broken up because of King's Cadence. It's going to be here on the last Sunday in October. Uh, So this will cover five weeks when you include them, but a four week series that I'm calling Life Under Construction. All of us are construction projects, all of us are in a state of construction being built. Um, None of us have arrived yet. It doesn't matter what age we're in, what season of life we're in, that's constantly changing. We, um, we have a couple of, of teenagers. We're, we're going to ha- have another teenager here real soon. And then uh, we were doing some calculations in a few months. Um, before I hit the age of 50, we're going to have four teenagers in our home, four teenagers in our family. Now, I'm not ready for that season of life. I'm still under construction. One of those kids keeps telling me, hey, Dad, I need some fall clothes. I need some fall clothes. But she doesn't mean this fall. She needs next fall because that's when she'll be going off to college, and she needs those clothes now. We're not ready for that stage yet. Some of you are in your own stage of life where you're dealing with with your own issues, issues that, that I'm not even aware of yet, issues that I'll face when I get to be your age. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in church either. All we have to do is look at the disciples and we see these men who spent so much time with Jesus and yet so often they got things wrong. All of us are under construction. We are a project under construction. And that's what we're going to look at. Today we're going to look at a master builder. You might even think a general contractor. This series kind of has this motif of home construction. And uh, when I was, let's see, about fifth or sixth grade, my parents decided they were going to put in a a pool in the backyard, an in-ground pool. Now when I say that my parents decided that they were going to put that in, I don't mean my mother. My mother was not in any way, shape, or form involved in this process other than to offer her blessing. And when I say my dad decided to do this, I don't mean that he went out and found a pool company to come in and install an in-ground pool. When I say my dad put in an in-ground pool, I literally mean my dad put in an in-ground pool. And the reason for this is because when my dad was younger, in the summers, he would work for my grandfather. My grandfather's trade was pool building. In fact, he moved from Erie, Pennsylvania down to Orlando, Florida to work for a pool installer. That was my grandfather's trade. And my grandfather was living in Delaware at the time. And he and my grandmother, yeah, he and my grandmother would come down and uh, spend a couple of months in Florida visiting all the kids and grandkids, me, and during that time, that summer, my grandfather and my dad built an in-ground pool. Now, my children have come to me and said, hey, dad, we got to put in a pool. I said, I can't do that. The, the, Joel won't let us do that. But if I were going to build an in-ground pool, the best I could do is I could dig a hole, throw a tarp in it, fill it up, and I say, jump in and swim as long as that tarp holds that water. I mean, I have no expertise in building in-ground pools because I don't have the background, I don't have the skills that my grandfather had. And that's why we go to mechanics. I have a car that's in the shop right now because I don't know how to operate on an engine. We go to dentists to pull our teeth and to clean our teeth because there's things that we just can't do. We go to doctors because they know more about the human body than we do. We even go to barbers and hairstylists because we have just come through a pandemic and some of us have suffered through pandemic haircuts given by their father. You can talk to one of these children over here where his daddy gave him a haircut And his mom was yelling at him, don't do his bangs, don't do his bangs. But what do I do? I did his bangs. Cut those things right off. Poor kid. We go to places because we need that expertise. So when we look at building our life, so often we look at building our life and we rely upon ourselves. We rely upon our own expertise, our own ability. So look in Psalm 127. 
This is a unique song, but psalm because it's written by Solomon. There's only two psalms that were attributed to Solomon, and this happens to be one of them. This is a song of ascents, which we believe is, is um, one theory is that this is something that they would have sung as they were journeying up to Jerusalem. They would be singing um, many of these psalms, this being one of them. Look what Solomon says here in verse one. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Now, I, I think what Solomon is telling you and what he's telling me is that if you're gonna build your life alone, you're gonna build that life in vain. If you're gonna build your life alone, you are going to build that life in vain. Vain is a word that means worthless. It's worthless. It's either worthless materially speaking or it's worthless more morally speaking. And when you think about what Solomon is saying, don't forget who Solomon is, but when you think about what Solomon is saying here, it's, it's shocking to, to think that you could have someone who could build his life and in the course of building his life earns a great amount of money materially speaking, whether that be the job that they have the wealth that they are able to secure from that job or from their influence in our society, the, the perks that they enjoy. I mean, somebody who lives in this great house and has all the, the perks that, that society can offer them and we look at them and say, wow, they are materially blessed or materially superior than the average person. Solomon would look at them and say, yeah, but if they built that alone, it's all worthless. We could look at somebody who's built their life morally. I mean, there's a lot of people who played Little League Baseball, went to Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, married their high school sweetheart, took a job at the factory, and worked that job until they were promoted up to supervisor and eventually they decided they would retire and they got the gold watch and, and they played on the company bowling team and all that kind of stuff and, uh, and they cheered for their, their team on Sundays and at their funeral, a lot of people are gonna show up because they lived a great life, a moral life, had a lot of friends, a lot of relationships, and did life right. And Solomon would look at them and say, yeah, but if they built that life alone, they built in vain. It's worthless. Now, don't forget who Solomon is. Solomon's the guy who wrote that weird book called Ecclesiastes. And if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, I think we've preached through it. But Ecclesiastes can go one of two ways. You can interpret it as either Solomon is this wise sage who has looked at life from every angle and he realizes in, in spiritual terms that, that life has so many vain, meaningless aspects. He uses the word 33 times in the book, the word vanity. Or you could read it, and that's the way I interpret it, but you could also read it as Solomon's just bitter. And there are some who believe that, that Solomon was just bitter. Ah, life's just meaningless. Think about who Solomon was. He was one of the most powerful, wealthy kings in the nation of Israel. In fact, I saw one site that suggests when you take Solomon's wealth and compare it to today's wealth, he was worth about $2 trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars. He had women. He had wives. He had concubines. And he had power. And he had influence. And yet Solomon is saying, with all of his material possessions, with all of the power and influence and perks that he had in this society, he would look at his life and he would say, yeah, but if I built my kingdom alone, it's worthless. At the end of the day, it's worthless. Now what is Solomon doing for us? He's highlighting something, and I think what he's highlighting is found in verse two. It is vain, it's worthless for you to rise up early, to sit up late, and to eat the bread of sorrows. It's worthless to do that. 
It's worthless to get up so early to work until the wee hours of the night to toil and sacrifice just to put food on your table. It's vanity to do that. It's worthless to do that. Now, what was he saying? Is he saying that, it's, it's, that we shouldn't go out there and, and work hard? No, absolutely not. Solomon is the same guy who said that a person who is lazy is a brother to one who destroys. A lazy person is just like somebody who comes in and wrecks everything. That's what Solomon said. He wrote that in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 9. But I think there's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Solomon's not negating the fact that hard work is necessary, but he is forcing us to ask this question. When we do work hard to build our life, when we do work hard, who are we really relying upon? Who are we really relying upon? And you think, well, I I don't struggle with that. Be careful. One of the most, arguably, one of the most godly men to ever walk this planet was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul struggled with this issue of relying upon himself. Keep your place in Psalm chapter 127 and turn very quickly to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And while you're turning, there's an expression that we often say, the Lord will not put upon us more than we can bear. You ever heard that? I'm sure you have. The Lord will never put on us more than we can bear. And I know why you say that. I think why you say that is because there is a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, if I remember correctly, where he says that he will not tempt us beyond what we are able to bear. He will not tempt us. But I would be very careful saying that God will not allow more into our life than we can bear. Because I, based upon this text, I wonder if he does. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is what the Apostle Paul says to us. We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. We don't want you to be unaware. You need to know this. We had trouble. It came to us while we were in Asia. We were burdened beyond measure. We were burdened above our strength so that we despaired even of life. Now, we don't know what episode Paul is talking about. All we know is that it was a whole lot of stuff thrown into his life that was very overwhelming. It was beyond his strength and it left him wanting death. Death was the escape route for Paul in this situation. There was so much going on in his life, so many trials, so many tribulations that he was so overwhelmed by this that he despaired for even life. And verse 9 tells us, he says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourself. And here's why. So that we should not trust in ourselves, but in a God who raises the dead. That we would not trust in ourselves to build our own life, to shape our own life, to rely upon our own strength and our own ability, but instead we would be men and women, boys and girls who put our faith in a God who raises the dead. And that's what Solomon, I believe, was saying. This is what Paul battled with. There is this something inside of us where we want to build our life. And Solomon says, oh, if you can do that, and some of you might be successful in doing that, but you will realize at the end of your life, all of that was in vain if you built alone. What you need in your life is a master builder. You need a general contractor. You need somebody to partner with you as you build this life. And that's what I want to come to. As we think about this self-reliance, you know, we can do this in our relationships. We can do this in our marriage. We can do this in our parenting. We can do this in our friendships. Uh, this affects our career as we uh, think about our ability to perform. We rely upon our own knowledge and wisdom. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't go to school. Yes, absolutely. Go get the education that you need for the job that you want. But ultimately, you're trusting in God. Sometimes our our identities can get wrapped up in our careers. This affects our church life. You know you can build a church by man's ways? Do you realize that you can build a church and completely ignore God? It's done all the time. We build a church not through our ways, not through our preferences, but through God's ways. 
And that's what happens so often when we, we have this self-reliance. We have these inward eyes and we, we constantly look inside of these four walls and we, we begin to tweak and we begin to shape and how can we, how can we change things in order to, to make our own selves happy instead of relying upon God to partner with God and to ask God, hey, what do you want from us, Father? How can we partner with you? And when you get, and I don't want to get too philosophical because I know you're sweating and I'm sweating, but it seems so foolish, doesn't it? I mean, it does to me because I know me. You know, we, we, we want God to bless our home. We want God to bless our family. We want God to bless our relationships. But when you think about our home and our family and our relationships, oftentimes God is just kind of an afterthought. We give him some token attention, but we expect him to lavish out all these blessings. Another aspect that I think about is if I'm going to, if I'm going to build an in-ground pool, it's going to be a hole in the ground with a blue tarp. When my dad and grandfather built a pool and we filled it up with water, it actually held water. And we can go out and we can try and build our lives and we can shape our future and we can try and plan our future. But that future is limited to our own abilities. Or we can partner with God, the same God who spoke this world into existence, the same God who raised the dead, as Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in a God who is able to raise the dead because he can do so much more than we can. We're limited. And that's the last point. God wants to partner with us. Did you know that God wants to partner with you? Look at the last phrase of Psalm chapter 127, verse 2. He gives his beloved sleep. Why do you get up early? Why do you get up late? Why do you toil through life, trying to live life in your own strength and your own power when you have a heavenly father who wants to give sleep and rest to his beloved? You know, when you look back in your life, as I look back in my life, I'm almost positive that your life has some regrets in it. I mean, doesn't it? I'm not gonna ask you what they are, but doesn't your life have some regrets in it? Mine does. Do you know what those regrets are? The reminders. Those regrets are reminders of those times where I was building my life alone. Those regrets are reminders that I was trying to build my life without a master builder. I was trying to do it in my own strength, in my own wisdom, my own ability. What does Solomon say again? Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Christian, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean in your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. That's what Solomon told us. And how do we do this? Well, I I think practically, I think prayer is involved. We've got to have conversations with God. We've got to talk to God about our life. In fact, I would say that if prayer is not going on in your life, that is a gauge for you. That gauge is telling you you're building life alone. You're building your life alone. You're not having conversations with a general contractor. I think the other thing is that we we have to read his word. We have to know what the master builder is saying to us. When we read the Bible, uh, it it identifies for us what is true and what's not true. This is the basis for life. It it provides guardrails. So many questions out there in life are answered because of the Bible. Not every question is answered, of course not, but there sure is a lot of them. There sure is a lot of them that are answered. And the Bible gives us parameters and guidelines so we know where we can go and where we can't go. So I think we have to have conversations with God. We have to talk to him and we have to allow him to talk to us. And then I think, and this is gonna be one of the things that we look at later on through this series, we have to have people around us, godly people around us, because God uses other godly men and women as instruments of guidance and direction in life.
And when we're trusting the Lord with all of our heart, when we're not leaning in our own uh, understanding, but in all of our ways we're acknowledging him, he will direct our paths. And so many times in my life, and I'm sure you have your own stories, that direction has come through conversations with other individuals. I'm a, I'm a pastor today. I can take you back to two conversations. One of them was my wife in the food court of the West Oaks Mall in Okoy, Florida. The other one was in a Taco Mac in downtown Chattanooga. Those two conversations shaped the trajectory of my life. Do you think I had that in my head when we walked into the West Oaks Mall on that day to decide whether I was going to take business or Bible as I continued my college education? No. And it was one phrase in that Taco Mac, one phrase that unleashed my reservations about becoming a pastor. I never had a dream that that would happen as we sat down and, and ordered off that menu. There is a God in heaven who wants to partner with you to shape and to build your life. And as you think back on those regrets, I would just ask you, how many of those regrets could have been avoided if you would have prayed about that decision in advance? How many of those decisions would have gone differently if you would have read and obeyed what you see in the Bible? And how many of regrets would those would have been avoided because you listened to godly counsel? How many times do we go against what we know is right, what we've been told is right? But let me close by asking the, the, the question that, that, that I see in this text. I mean, I'm, I'm a skeptic too. I, I, have, I have some reservations here. How, how can somebody, Solomon, Solomon, how can you honestly say that somebody who has so much materialistic wealth and who lives such a seemingly moral lifestyle, how can you tell me that their life is worthless, vanity, meaningless? How can you say that? Solomon would say, I believe, that you, you can live a morally good life and you can build great wealth in this world. It is possible, especially in America. But it is impossible for you to build in the next life. Your brains, your connections, your charisma, all of your hard work, ethic, all of that may be effective in building a good life in this physical world. But it is impossible to build a successful life in the spiritual world. And you would say, well, okay, Solomon, I, I get that, but how do you know? Okay, let me tell you somebody else. Jesus, this is what Jesus would say. What does it profit a man? What does it profit a woman if they were to gain the whole world? And what Jesus is saying is that it's possible. I mean, there's hyperbole here, yes, but there is a possibility. You could gain the whole world, but lose your own soul. Self-reliance builds great companies. Self-reliance builds great financial portfolios. Self-reliance builds great careers, and it builds great families, and it can build great futures. But self-reliance will send every man and every woman to hell for all of eternity. Every single one of us has to come to realize that it is impossible. It is impossible for us to get to heaven by ourselves. We need a savior. We need a savior. And Solomon's telling us, yeah, but that, I'm, that's just the eternal. But right here in the real world, I, I'm telling you, you need a master builder in your life too. You need a general contractor. So now that I'm talking to Christians, we've already settled the savior issue. We have our eternal destiny worked out. What are we doing here? Solomon's telling you, hey, if you want to build your life alone, it's meaningless. Partner with God. Pray, 
Read his word. Listen to godly counsel. Put some people around you that can guide you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let God be the master builder of your life. May I pray for you? Father, we thank you that you are willing to partner with us and we acknowledge the temptation, just like Paul had, the temptation to build our life on our own strength and our own ability. And as I look out over this congregation, the, the, the people that are here, I don't know their spiritual condition, Lord. And I pray that my voice would be heard in their ears and in their hearts. And I would say, friend, what are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in to get you to heaven? If you're relying upon your own abilities, your own church attendance, your own good works, it's impossible. You can't get to heaven on your own. And I just want to speak into your life. You need a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. And I'll be down front. If you want to have a conversation about that, we would love to do that. But please, don't be so naive. Don't be so self-absorbed, so prideful to think that you can have a relationship with God because you're a good person, because of something that you have done. Please don't insult God by thinking that way. This is why he sent Jesus to the earth, because you can't do it on your own. We need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. Don't build this life alone, and don't build the next life alone either. Father, would you teach that to us? Would you speak into our hearts? Would you bring conviction? And would you take us from this place in your peace and your safety? And as you have said, Father, would you give us that sleep, that rest, that confidence that you so desire to give to your beloved? Thank you that that is who we are when we have made you our God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for suffering through a very warm service. Remember, Sunday school begins same time, many of the same locations next Sunday. Remember, we'll be voting on deacons at the beginning of the service. We pray that it will be much cooler. But have a great Sunday. Have a great week. And may the Lord bless you.